The Galen Centre for Health and Social Policy, in collaboration with the Cancer Care Working Group, organised a webinar on accessing breast cancer care during MCO and COVID-19. The webinar aimed to discuss challenges and adjustments in breast cancer care during this period for both patients and clinicians. At this point in time, Malaysia is in phase three of a nationwide uh, movement control order or MCO that will end on 28th April 2020, concluding six weeks of restricted movement imposed to combat the spread of COVID-19 in the country. The webinar is the first in a series of uh, discussions concerning cancer care and COVID-19, which was conducted through the Zoom platform. And most importantly for today's session, which is we're talking about accessing breast cancer care, is, is that when it comes to cancer uh, treatment, a lot of patients, a lot of uh, people living with cancer are very anxious as to how uh, they are able to access uh, some of those services that they've needed to be able to access uh, during a period uh, when there is no uh, MCO. And now with the MCO, we are coming up to a situation where uh, there's a lot of services that have become uncertain, uh, unsure in terms of how uh, we should actually uh, uh, manage our treatment. What happens if somebody has a, uh, uh, a course of treatment that is necessary that is now being interrupted because the MCO can people actually go to hospitals and clinics and keep our appointments, etc. So today we have with us uh, two very, very well qualified individuals who can speak to this issue. And uh, first of all, we have uh, Ms. Siu Budlui, who comes from Kuching, Sarawak, all the way there across the uh, uh, <laughs> South China Sea. Uh, you may have read her recent article in The Star, actually, where she has been talking about her own experiences uh, dealing with COVID-19. And please do take a look at the article uh, where uh, she had to fly over to uh, Sumananjo to access some of the treatment that she was needing to, to have and then had to fly back. I'm not going to ask how much that cost, but Lulie has had that experience, uh, which is not uh, unique just to, one, to, to her, but a lot of other patients as well. And so I'm hoping that she'll be able to share with us a little bit of her experience uh, on that shortly. Uh, with us also is a, a consultant oncologist and head of oncology services from Pantai Hospital Kuala Dr. Masura Mahipsub, who is not uh, unfamiliar to many of you. Uh, I'm sure she is uh, a very reassuring face and whose voice in terms of giving advice can sometimes be stern, but very much necessary at these times. And certainly, uh, we're hoping that uh, Masuko here, especially when it comes to uh, accessing uh, treatment, uh, she'll be able to talk a little bit about how she is viewing uh, the situation from a private health hospital's point of perspective, but also in terms of the quality of care uh, that is needed to ensure that we're able to maintain uh, the kind of uh, treatment uh, that's necessary for cancer patients. So I uh, welcome both of you, uh, Bunri and Dr. Masura. Thank so you. let's start off. Yeah, yeah let's start off uh, and talk about accessing Breast cancer okay. care during the MCO and COVID period. Uh, let's start with you, Budwe. Um, how is it over there in Kuching? How has the MCO affected uh, patients uh, going to uh, appointments in, uh, I, I presume, Sarawak General Hospital? Yeah, uh, thank you for having me, Asro. Yeah, so uh, what I can see in Kuching is that uh, uh, patients might have to postpone their appointment if it is not urgent or just follow up. Uh, my doctors have personally told me that they have to do that so that they can reduce the traffic flow in the oncological department itself. And of course, the, in terms of surgeries, the elective surgeries are probably postponed. And those who can, that cannot be postponed are actually still being carried out. And Currently, the surgical site, they have actually moved to another hospital, which is the Pusat Jantong, Kota uh, Samarahan, uh, not too far from Kuching City, where they use the operating theatre there. <clears throat> so there's a surgery site, as, as far as I know. As for chemotherapy, things still go on as usual, as far as I can understand. And um, 
As for myself, I, I did have a very interesting experience having to go over to KL for my advanced radiation therapy treatment. And actually, my, my trip actually happened on the second day of our first phase of MCU on the 19th of March. Yeah. And why I have to do so is because uh, there's a discovery of a tumor with aggressive growth in my liver, which did not respond very well to my earlier treatment through an ablation procedure last October. <coughs> So in early March, I discovered through CT scan, and my doctor advised me to seek the consultation and possibly treatment in KL since this advanced technique is not available in Beijing. So I did that. At that time, I didn't realize that FCO is going to be in place. <laughs> and I bought my ticket, and then uh, a day or two before I, I yeah, I flew to KL, I realized, oh oh, MCO kick in already. Could I really fly over? Uh, so a lot of question mark in my head. But uh, uh, thankfully, uh, I managed to pass through all the hurdles. I and I received and completed all my treatment uh, in a private hospital in PJ. And I came back on the 29th. So the trip was like a 10 night stay in a hotel room, but by myself because I was advised to be isolated. Yeah. So it's every day is just. Hospital and hotel, and nowhere else. But we should be asking whether yeah. those four five star hotel that you ended up in, <laughs> like some of those people have been quarantined, right? <laughs> oh, I think uh, I don't know three or four star. It doesn't matter as long as it's clean, <laughs> safe, and very near, the, so that I can get the transport needed to the hospital as I as and when I needed. So I did that and. I also, most of the days, I go for room service. And of course, everything is on my, at my own cost. Lah. Yeah. So, so the first thing is I make sure that I have my letter from the doctor, the referral letter from GH here, so that in any case, immigration asks, question me, I can show that because it's a medical treatment need that I fly. So, so far, no problem. I actually went to check the day before I flew. And upon reaching the private hospital, I was asked to do COVID-19 test. So actually, I delayed my appointment with my doctor for two days because the result only came out the day after, uh, late night. I arrived on Thursday. I got the result Friday late night. So I managed to see the doctor only on Friday, uh, Saturday morning. And then the following one week was actually the time for treatment. Yeah. Uh, and this was, sorry, I missed that. Was that a private hospital or public private. hospital? It's a private hospital. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, and you had to go back on the same day or uh, After my very first trip to the hospital, I, of course, I didn't have a chance to go inside. I was just at the tent, no, to do the nasal swab and the stroke swab. And then I was asked to just go back to my hotel and stay there until my result was out. So only on Saturday, the third day I arrived in KL, yeah, I managed to see my doctor inside the hospital. Yeah. yeah. What was the so, question? Yeah, so so there there is quite a number of procedures that have been put into place uh, to help protect uh, both uh, the healthcare workers as well as patients themselves, even Correct. when they're attending uh, uh, to appointments that have already been pre-scheduled. <coughs> so we know that in some of the public and private hospitals, there's been uh, some rescheduling of non -elect, uh, of elective surgeries uh, right. so that there is a now uh, a prioritization on making a lot of the hospitals uh, be focused on treating uh, patients with COVID. So I just want to ask you, Dr. Masura, yourself, uh, uh, you're based in Penplang Valley and you're an anti-hospital. And I think just before we came on, I was just asking you uh, where, how's the, the, the pace of work uh, like uh, because now that there are less people coming to going to the hospitals, but you said to me just now that you've been working every day. How's it like uh, in terms of uh, you know moving from your house to your workplace and seeing patients? Thanks for the question because um, it, it's very important for us as uh, doctors managing cancer to um, take care of ourselves first before we could take care of the patients and also help our colleagues elsewhere that may have difficulty giving access to, to 
patients because of limitations that we know. So for me, I, I work in two hospitals and these are two uh, comprehensive cancer centres. So therefore, we do have a steady stream of patients. That are, uh, I, I would say that I, I divide my patients into either new cases or existing cases on treatment or existing cases on follow-up means they have established uh, cancer diagnosis, they have completed treatment, either they are stage 4 or early stage, but they are on follow-up. And then I also have walk-ins. Um, so the walk-ins are sporadic cases from other hospitals or other even foreign countries. So these are the four uh, group of patients that I see. So of course, I see a drop in the number of new cases. So and also a drop in the, num uh, in the number of foreign cases because no, no foreign uh, patients are coming. So uh, no foreign patients uh, on existing treatment are coming, and um, um, and uh, so and uh, for, for the follow up uh, for for cancer patients on follow up actually although that we don't have any existing data at the moment to show that patients with cancer are at increased risk of getting the infection, uh, and we only know that elderly has an increased risk for complications if they have uh, developed the COVID-19 disease. But even though we know that and we don't have you know, a good data to show that cancer patients have an increased risk for the disease, but we contact our patients who are on follow-up and, and let them know that they don't have to come, they can actually postpone it. But there are some patients whom they are actually due for some assessment, for example, early breast cancer patients who are due for their mammogram, ultrasound. And we only know that elderly has an increased risk for complications if they have uh, developed the COVID-19 disease. But even though we know that and we don't have you know, a good data to show that cancer patients have an increased risk for the disease, but we contact our patients who are on follow-up and, and let them know that they don't have to come, they can actually postpone it. But there are some patients whom they are actually due for some assessment, for example, early breast cancer patients who are due for their mammogram, ultrasound, their routine assessment or maybe some patients who are on for routine assessment uh, with scans because they have higher risk disease. So there are some of these patients who have uh, postponed. There are some who actually did come. Although if you look at the, prior, prior, uh, how, the priority of care for them is actually not uh, on the medium or high priority, but some of them individually decided to come. So, uh, so we, do, we do see a mix of patients such as this, okay? But like, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the early cases have dropped, the number of early cases have dropped. So we are wondering whether there are patients out there with breast cancer who have not been diagnosed. Either they, they, um, uh, they fear the, 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 the infection itself, they fear the fact that if they come for a procedure, they may have to be tested for the COVID-19 uh, for the for the coronavirus uh, tests and therefore if they you know if they are positive you know they fear that or there are patients out there who have been diagnosed who probably have had surgery but have not been started on any adjuvant treatment but they are in the high or at least medium priority list where they are supposed to actually get treatment but they are not getting any treatment so we have a drop in the number of that that uh, patient proportion so that's what we are see, uh, we're seeing daily at the moment Anyhow, um, as for the doctors per se, in the, in the host two hospitals that I work with, um, of course, we are busier as well because we have to also uh, keep updated about um, the current public health management and the hospital oh. management mm -hmm. yeah, for COVID-19. So we are also busier with that. And uh, for lady doctors like me, we are also busier trying to make sure everything at home is also speak and span. So yeah, sometimes I, I also um, appreciate the fact that the number of patients that I see in the, cl in the clinic or in the hospital is lesser because I have more time probably trying to deal with the, with the other aspect of my life other than the patients. <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to welcome again to uh, all of our uh, participants for today's uh, webinar. Uh, welcome. You are attending the Accessing Breast Cancer Care uh, during MCO and COVID-19 webinar, just in case uh, there are people who are tersesat maso and thinking this is a webinar on how to uh, make uh, or bake bread. Uh, so I just wanted to remind everyone here that uh, you can send your questions over to me through the chat 
uh, function that's on uh, your Zoom. Uh, so if you have anything that you'd like to ask, please do send it via the chat function that's on your uh, application. And I will uh, forward it to our two speakers here. So we will be answering questions throughout the session. So uh, Dr. Mas, uh, you know, one of the things that, that we heard at the beginning uh, of the MCO was the restrictions concerning movement of people from uh, one area to another area, meaning from their house to a 10 kilometer radius. Uh, they cannot go more than 10 kilometers or they cannot go to another state. Uh, and at one point, it also included uh, medical care that they needed to have uh, permission from the police in order for them to move. And uh, letters uh, from the doctors don't, didn't seem to work. But from what you're telling me right now, it's because there's so much uh, of a steady flow into your hospital, I presume that patients are having no problems uh, getting from their house to uh, hospitals to, uh, to keep up with their appointments uh, for their cancer treatment. Is that correct? Uh, in, in the beginning, when I think the first one or two days when when there was this confusion over interstate travel, as well as there's a confusion about uh, um, um, trips that they make to hospitals were, were not clear yet at that time, then there was an issue with regards to this. But of course, even now, we have uh, occasional um, um, issues with certain areas where perhaps the, the police officers or the soldiers are not so clear uh, with the, the fact that not every state in this country have oncology facility mm. and not every state in this country has a breast cancer unit, for example. So yeah. they may not know that patients have to come to these specific centers in order for them to get treatment. So that's one, one uh, thing that Malaysians need to know that is much uh, many of the oncology centers in our country is uh, focused in just certain areas of therefore patients from certain states such as Pahang, such as uh, Kedah or Terengganu may have to travel far in order for them to actually get treatment. And uh, the second thing is the fact that for patients whom they need to travel to the hospital, some of them may not be able to travel alone because they are probably elderly that requires support from the children to bring them to the hospital. So one child may have to drive the car and the other child may have to come down and take the wheelchair down and get the patient down. So therefore, there may be more than one person in the car coming to the hospital. So that is also some an issue that, that my, my patient uh, face when they tried to come to the hospital. So another thing is um, uh, patients that may tell you that they are worried about roadblocks but actually their family members are worried about bringing them to the hospital. So sometimes <laughs> the, the, the story may be a bit um, um, altered lah because of that, right? But otherwise yeah. I think they, if they contact us and get the, the letter from us and actually show to the police then, uh, that they have an appointment to see us, then that's fine. But I've also heard of patients having to take off her wig in order for the policeman to believe that she's actually a, a, a patient on chemotherapy for her breast cancer. Yo. And uh, that is just because she, she wore makeup. And because she wore makeup, she doesn't look like a sick person that is going to the hospital <laughs> for chemotherapy. So that's not good. So, um, yeah, so I think the 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 the, the mentality that is within our our relation is that if you're a cancer patient, you have to look bad, and that's not true. So yeah, so that that's among the issues that I, I hear. So I have I have had at least two two instances where my patient was asked to actually turn around, but one of uh, one of the patient that was asked to turn around make a U turn. She she was smart, so she called the the police. Uh, station and got the the superior police to actually allow her to to pass through she was actually from Pahang to go to Subang I mean I think there's uh, some some really positive uh, uh, stories that have been coming out that even though there have been some limitations in terms of movement but also for people to get uh, to the hostel appointments uh, they have That's been that. able to negotiate with the police at the roadblocks and to be able to uh, 
dengan belas esan and with mm. the discretionary powers of the police being able to to get that overcome kan so uh, yeah but, but yeah, there, there was also a, a, another case where the patient had to travel the patient's husband had to travel from Terengganu in order for him to get some uh, morphine or opiate based drugs for the wife who's actually bed bound so the policeman showed the 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 patient's husband uh, a newspaper clip that showed that hospitals uh, can actually post uh, drugs to patients but this is not for all drugs so some drugs yeah are, are, are expensive or they had to be you know um uh, stored or you know uh, kept in a, in a certain temperature or anything like that. So it's, it's not so easy for us to just post the drug and then it's going to be, you know, uh, speak and spend when the, the drug arrives. And oh. in drugs that are called, uh, it's, it's, it's a controlled drug like morphine, you know, like, like Targin or, or fentanyl. It's not so easy to actually just post it because these are control items. Uh, so, so this is also something that I, I think our police people have to know that, that certain drugs we cannot post. So the patient has to come it, 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 It's a lot to ask for our police officers to uh, know and to appreciate some of the concerns of a cancer patient. So we have Bun Lui here who was able to travel from Kuching uh, to Kuala Lumpur for treatment and then to go back. And there are some people who can't even travel from Malacca to KL uh, to meet with appointments. So there's been a lot of, of discussions uh, amongst patients, not only on cancer, but also other diseases as well, in terms of how they're going to ensure that they're able to meet treatment. So there's been a lot of uh, discussion uh, with regards to what the Ministry of Health hospitals, the public hospitals are doing and the private hospitals are doing. So uh, at the moment, uh, a lot of the MOH hospitals have uh, reprioritized many of their uh, uh, their priority procedures and uh, they've also started asking private hospitals to start taking on some of their uh, patients. So uh, have you started to see uh, private hospitals start managing cancer patients from the Ministry of Health or taking up their patient load? Is this for Bun? Oh, sorry, uh, for you, Dr. Master. Uh, oh, for me? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So, okay, there has been uh, many discussions being done between the Ministry of Hospital, uh, Ministry of Health and then the, the Private Hospital uh, Association with regards to taking in non-COVID patients who require treatment. And uh, I think there have been uh, recent, the last few days, there have been a few hospitals that have been like so-called selected uh, after a, 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 a somewhat a, a program uh, have been devised uh, in between the, the two agencies and um, and I guess uh, in the next few weeks uh, this will start as in formally. Uh, informally before this uh, they have had referrals uh, by public hospitals to the uh, private hospitals or patients just come in and, and, and try to get uh, treatment themselves but these are patients that either they have some money or they have uh, insurance uh, to help them with the payment. But I know that there are some hospitals that already were giving discounts, uh, mm -hmm. heavy discounts as much as 30% or 40% to these patients. So this is really uh, very, very encouraging. And I would say I, I, I'm very proud to, to know of this, uh, especially these are the hospitals that, that perhaps had, had um, established um, uh, buying service uh, um, era last time. I mean, last time uh, mm. there are some hospitals uh, in, in in private sector that were that government bought services from from them for their for the government patients. So so these are the hospitals that were were delivering uh, uh, services to these patients in with uh, with a heavy discount uh, in the very beginning. But after this, we will have a formal uh, MOU, la, I would say, between the, the public and the private hospitals. But I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I cannot tell you. <laughs> which of course. Yeah. Now. <laughs> but no, I, I mean, I, I think, I think it's, a, it's very encouraging for a lot of uh, patients to hear that uh, the possibility of continuing on with treatment is there that they yeah. can move from the Ministry yeah, of Health I, to I, the private. I know of many doctors that actually were delivering care pro bono, okay? And there were also many doctors uh, who have actually helped patients to get funds. Uh, for example, there was Hazana Fund at Pantai the other day and I know uh, our, our, our breast surgeon, Patricia, 
got uh, fund just before the fund uh, the fund basically got stopped uh, to to actually help some patients who were actually from the public sector who who were actually waiting okay. for uh, for their surgery to be done. So yeah, there are many 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 out there, uh, but uh, it is there. It's just that probably um, it needs to be better streamlined to to look at priorities. So patients, we have to do a tier kind of a tiering of what are the priorities. So those who are in the higher priorities should 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 get this kind of uh, services earlier or offers Com, uh, uh, followed by medium priority and then low priority. Maybe the low priority can, can wait. So well, you know, Dr. Masro, this is one of the, the advantages of being in the Klang Valley, that uh, these situations are able to be um, Flexi, yeah. you can negotiate, you can, because the proximity, yeah. you can communicate, as long as people work together, things can happen. But in places like Sarawak, and I think this is where Bunui, if you could come in at this point, uh, uh, can tell us a little bit about the challenges facing uh, patients over there in Sarawak. Because in the normal situation, non-crisis, non-COVID-19 situation, we heard it was really challenging for many patients to be able to come to Kuching uh, to get uh, treated for cancer. And some of them even have to fly to Sunanjomes in the case of Bunui here uh, for specialized treatment. So how is it now over there in, in Kuching because of the MCO? How are cancer patients, how are people under the uh, Society for Cancer Advocacy and Awareness Kuching handling the uh, current MCO? Well, as you know, in Kuching or in Sarawak, Actually, there's only one Sarawak Junior Hospital in Kuching that is providing um, oncological treatment. And in the recent years, we do have a private hospital, Borneo Medical Center in Kuching, that is also starting to provide uh, uh, oncological services, including especially radiotherapy. So at least for the radiotherapy side, um, uh, there's another place to fall back to for patients and of course uh, there's always a difficulty for patients outside of Kuching like Miri and other towns or cities of Sarawak receiving treatment so it has been a problem with or without COVID-19 yeah however as far as traveling is concerned if the patient is willing to come to Kuching I do not see any problem now because the Sarawak government here has already given all the leeway for patients to travel for the required or urgent treatment knowing that especially like for cancer patients, they can only receive treatment here in Kuching, whether it's a private or a public hospital. It's just one here and one there in Kuching. So uh, traveling itself is not really a big issue. The thing is, another issue that we, I see and observe is that a lot of patients, they try not to go to hospital. Everybody is fearful. It's like, oh, GH is a COVID-19 hospital. Or try, I try not to come if I, if I can. Same, it happens to me. I'm also fearful. But for my case, like my treatment, even though I'm on targeted therapy, um, and recently I have to increase my dosage to see better effi, um, efficacy. So I have to go to GH for blood tests once every two weeks. And I also know that the blood test lab is not too far away from the entrance for emergency or you know maybe the suspected mm. patient so Risky. i have to tell you everybody is scared including myself so when i entered the lab the building with the lab uh i know my heart went very fast <laughs> so <laughs> or other patients i myself also feel scared of course i put on my mask i put on my spec <laughs> i don't have goggles but i have a spec <laughs> and very careful and of course, our hospital here, just like any other private hospitals in uh, elsewhere, we, uh, everyone is taking a lot of precautions, for example, not just the patients, the staff, but the hospital setting as in physical distancing, seating arrangement. Of course, you see the panka here, panka there, people can only sit on the alternate seat, right? And uh, we have to be smart to choose a time to go to the hospital when we know that most likely there won't be too many people to do blood tests. Like we avoid morning. So I went in the afternoon. So I, I, I did that. And then um, as far as chemotherapy was concerned, I think uh, what the hospital was trying to do is to space out and, and still try to schedule accordingly. This is in GH. And if 
my doctor also told me, you're so scared to come to GH, you can do your blood test in private hospital. <laughs> but I didn't do that because I want a fast result for my case. Yeah, and our public hospital gave me the result within like uh, 10, 15 minutes after my blood test. Mm -hmm. Because I need to have my white blood count uh, immediately to know whether I can proceed with my targeted therapy drug. Yeah, so that's a scenario. Everybody feel fearful. If possible, don't go to hospital. <laughs> that is all in our mind, you know. So well, um, I think it's quite prudent there. I think Bunui that you don't go to the hospital unless you really have to, and uh, yeah. it's a situation which I wish a lot of people would understand. Because sometimes even now they bring relatives even while they're going to the hospital, and they may not okay. necessarily okay. need to go. Right. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So uh, because of this, we as a, a patient group of our society scan, uh, in the past few months, we've been doing peer counseling and we stopped doing that because it has to be face to face. So we can't do that. We have really stopped since uh, mid February. So we have to stop most of our activities on service um, and even small uh, little seminars we stop. But we now turn to webinar like what you're doing today. We have also started to run a series of uh, talks, at a different session on different topics. At least we still manage to get something out for the people here in our community. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, Bunui, uh, because we've started to get more questions from the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that people are concerned about uh, is that, and I'm wondering whether there are patients over there in, in Kuching who are concerned also, is that, because they have to uh, delay or not go or defer their treatments to a later date, uh, there are some concerns that perhaps uh, their cancers would upstage uh, as a result of, of you know, the delay or deferment of that treatment. Are there concerns like that that are being voiced out by uh, your uh, colleagues over there in SCAN? Well, not so much of a delay in terms of treatment. I think a lot of time the delay or the rescheduling from uh, GH here is on for those patients who needing uh, who are needing uh, maybe more monitoring or follow up. Maybe they have to do it once every three four months. Now maybe become once every six months, like three months okay. later, months later, not this month. So yeah, it's more of an issue of monitoring yeah. uh, the yeah. progress of their treatment that they're concerned about. But radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and urgent surgery, let's say breast surgery, uh, can still carry out, be carried out. Maybe slightly there, but not like three months or six months later. Until okay. and unless um, the priority is really very low because of very, very early stage, maybe can be chemo first, then surgery, that kind of thing. This is what I understand from a surgeon. Yeah. Okay, let me put that question to Dr. Mastura then, because... Uh, there are people who have expressed this concern that because they're delaying, uh, you know, their chemo, their radio, targeted therapy because of this MCO period, it would actually risk uh, upstaging their, their cancer. Is this a real risk, Dr. Mastura? Yeah, of course, because uh, every patient is different. So therefore, if you're talking about breast cancer patients, so those patients whom uh, I would consider as high risk, and this is also in the guideline where... If you have patients who have a uh, high risk disease, if they are early stage cancer but high risk disease, means that they possibly have stage three uh, ER positive, HER2 negative cancer, or they have triple negative breast cancer, or they have HER2 positive breast cancer, maybe ER negative, HER2 positive. So these are patients, although they are not stage four, but they have high risk cancers. So in these patients, if they have not had uh, uh, surgery done, then perhaps a new adjuvant chemotherapy should be started for them. And uh, in those patients who have actually been on new adjuvant chemotherapy and they are due for surgery already, they have completed their new adjuvant treatment because they have high risk disease, then surgery for them is of a priority. For patients whom um, they have advanced stage disease, but they could have um, treatment that could alter their survival, meaning or, or improve their quality of life, then they also are, are, are of a priority to start treatment because of course it will become the impact of delaying treatment is going to be worse for them. For example, for somebody who has uh, HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer, where maybe treating them with anti-HER2 and chemotherapy may 
help with their liver metastasis, lung metastasis, or painful bone metastasis, and also improve their survival, then we should actually do it. Or of course, for patients who have visceral crisis stage four, means that if you don't do anything now, the patient dies now. So we have to do something. So that is the 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 key thing where uh, certain organization have actually put a clear perspective of what they categorize as high risk, what they categorize as medium risk, and what they categorize as low risk. So those in the high risk are in some of the examples I gave just now. So patients mm. like that. If let's say you have a patient who has, um, who, who's an elderly above 65 and who has stage one early early breast cancer, stage one, and then a uh, good group, ER positive, HER2 negative, then this, these are the kind of patients that you don't have to uh, perhaps do surgery right now. You can actually give them new adjuvant hormone first uh, because they have, there are data for new adjuvant hormone therapy for between six to eight months like that or up to six months before a patient is considered for surgery, which will be later once this COVID pandemic is, is probably over. There are also patients like that, that maybe they have, they have had surgery already, but you don't have to actually start the radiotherapy for them right now. You can just give them hormones. Mm -hmm. For those patients who have stage zero breast cancer, means that they have DCIS or LCIS. If they have had surgery already, leave them alone. <laughs> don't give radiotherapy for them at the moment. Uh, priority is for other people who have invasive disease, and in patients whom let's say you are plan, you know, planning them for uh, uh, let's say a one year of percept, uh, of of trust anti her two therapy, and then and the patient now is about six months, and they have maybe a good good uh, risk disease, then perhaps we can actually start uh, stop stopping at six months and not go beyond to one year. So this is something that we can discuss with each patient, but it depends on what, is, what are the patient's risk and what does, uh, you know, what, what are the patient's risk and, and, and how the patient see the risk of the disease, the, the, the viral disease and then, and then them uh, with the cancer. So it's, it's something new, it's something that is unprecedented for us. We are learning with the patient and with you all, of course. So I guess this, these are among uh, the suggestions that have been made uh, uh, by uh, organization, uh, international organization. And there, ha there have also been suggestions on how to actually make our radiotherapy, uh, the three weeks radiotherapy shorter. I have not tried that yet, um, uh, but that is something uh, worth uh, considering for some patients. Uh, meaning instead of three weeks or instead of five weeks, we can actually give the radiotherapy over five weeks or we can give the radiotherapy once a week for five weeks. So um, there are various uh, recommendations that have been put forward by a lot of organizations for the oncologists to actually discuss with each patient. You mentioned at the very beginning of your answer just now that each patient is different and therefore uh, the attending physician would actually have to advise the uh, patient exactly what stage or what kind of recommendation is possible, especially this is an MCO period, which basically, let's be honest, we don't know exactly when it's going to end. Uh, it could be extended further later on, even after Raya. So there's a lot of anxious people today about uh, what they should do, how they should go forward. And uh, there's been uh, the talk about telecounseling and perhaps some of these uh, patients who are needing to be postponed or people who are just anxious about where they are in terms of their treatment pathway, uh, especially during this uh, MCO and COVID period, can they just call up uh, the hospital and talk to people like yourself uh, as the attending physician or, or should they uh, be speaking to somebody uh, within uh, the uh, uh, team of doctors who are in charge of their care? Who should they speak to? And is uh, there any counselling really? Yeah, okay. So this, this is something that, that uh, we thought about because uh, one of the comments or one of the issues that were informed to me was about the, uh, their postponed uh, visits to the hospital. For example, if they are seeing their doctor every six months for their prescription of hormonal therapy, which they are taking daily, so from, let's say, they have appointment in April, then it gets extended to maybe June or July, for example, because maybe the hospital may uh, postpone cases due to inability to cope uh, at the moment or whatever issues that the hospital have. So for patients, in the patient's perspective, especially when they are uh, at the current state where they are cooked at home, you know, they have to, they, they, they're, they're, 
few changes in, in our day-to-day -day lives that actually adds to the stress uh, with them not being able to know when, you know, how am I going to get my drugs? Okay, um, you know, and uh, I, I call the hospital but the line is busy or nobody's, ans nobody's answering. So there has to be a, a, a system in built to actually cater to patients like this. So some, you know, a telecounseling or something like a, a direct access number for the patients to call so that they get reassured so that they don't get this anxiety okay? so uh for so th this this will be helpful for uh, i think in, in in my practice because we have we have assistants that actually speak to our patients and our patients also maybe can access us through emails and there are also some tele telemedicine uh, uh platform out there like telemi or there are some others, uh, I, I can't remember them, but I just remember telling me at the moment. <laughs> so oh. there are this, this platform that, where patients can actually uh, be invited by the doctors to actually, you know, correspond with them. So at least there's something. Uh, or, or, of course, it's best for, for the person talking to the patient to be the, the, the team that is managing the patient uh, rather than you get a third party <laughs> suddenly yeah, like, of course. you know, doing like that. So this is something to be considered because we are looking long term and we can we don't want our breast cancer patients to be you know super anxious at home and not knowing what to do and worse is if they go to social media platform in order for them to look for clues and that's not the way to go because the way to go is actually to speak to the people who are managing them and the way to go is actually to look at you know at well uh, you know a well well resourceful uh, organization uh, which i think not many patients are, have access to that. Lah. Maybe they don't, they don't look at all these um, websites, the, the, the good, good websites for cancers. Well, you know, there's a, there's a question here because, you know, we're talking about uh, cancer care, yes, but we're talking also about breast cancer. And uh, there's patients who are on uh, Trazumab IV intravenous and they're asking, can we change our treatment delivery to subcut? Uh, can this is be something that sent via email for home administration so that you don't have to go to the hospital. It's like uh, what uh, Bun Lui was saying just now. You don't want to go to the hospital, you don't go to the hospital. So you've got Trezumab, IV, can they go uh, convert to subcut? Um, yeah, they, uh, uh, it, it is, it is uh, one of the advice is actually to convert to subcutaneous uh, Trezumab. Yeah. Uh, it's just that I'm not sure whether the patient can actually deliver, uh, uh, you know, have um, inject themselves. themselves because the injection for trastuzumab is not like insulin. So uh, we inject it into the thigh and we have to do it slowly over five minutes and we alternate the thigh when we do that. So I, 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 I in my understanding now, I guess patient have to, to do it uh, in a train um, oncology center. Mm. Uh, but it's just that they are, they are, their administration time is actually shorter and therefore the patient uh, um, spends time less at the hospital. So that, that can be done, yes. Uh, Bunwei, can I ask you, right? There's uh, some cancer patients who are being referred to private hospital from public hospital. And then yep. when they're referred to private hospital, despite the fact that they are now discounts, as was Dr. Mastura was saying, that's given by the private hospitals. But unfortunately they still can't pay because it's the cost is too much are you hearing something like that from your uh, friends and colleagues because uh, a lot of people who are being referred to uh, from public to private are uh, having to suddenly spend a lot of money for their treatment where previously they didn't have to spend as much but now they have to think about spending a lot more are you seeing that uh, not in the recent weeks but as far, as far as radiotherapy is concerned, I do know that our GH doctors, our oncologists do refer patients to a private hospital, the only one here with radiotherapy. But there is always a complication because as far as radiotherapy is concerned, you know, there's always simulation that has to be done for a particular machine. So transferring a, a patient to another hospital for radiotherapy is like you have to do a lot of uh, preparation work like from the beginning. However, um, you're talking about referral. Um, it's typically, as far as I understand, is at the patient's cost. Unless it's halfway through and then getting the hospital, the private hospital to help. Then there may be a different views between our public hospital with private. That part, I'm not too sure. Like for my case, I was referred by my oncologist in 
public hospital to the private hospital uh, in uh, PJ. So every single cent I have to pay myself. Yeah. So there's no pre-arrangement of how or anything like that. So um, it is quite tough for those who do not have enough savings. I am thankful that I have enough savings to go through the treatment, which is actually quite expensive. But of course, since the treatment is available and it seems suitable for me, I had to give it a try, isn't it? That's why I went to see more. Yeah, what? so exact deal between the public hospital and the private hospital over here, I'm not quite aware. What? Well, let me ask, uh, let me ask uh, Dr. Mastura then, because basically the, the question here is when they can't afford to pay, can they then just defer uh, the surgery that they need to carry out, for example? Or is it depending on the case? I mean, how do they make these life and uh, life decisions uh, during this period? As far as I'm concerned, um Cases that you cannot defer, like I mentioned, uh, anybody with a bleeding or very painful breast tumor, you have to you have to do surgery. You can't defer it. Those who have completed their new adjuvant treatment, you have to do surgery. You cannot defer it. Those with high risk disease, those in chemotherapy in pregnancy, you have they are of high priority. You have to to treat them, and they they have to be prioritized higher. Anybody with uh, some, uh, for example, uh, we are talking about breast cancer, but I, I will give an example uh, of a patient who has uh, lung cancer, okay, early early stage lung cancer, whereby if you can do surgery for a very fit uh, person with early lung cancer, the, the, the survival outcome for the patient will be the best. But uh, because of the delay, in there's a waiting time for him to actually do the lung cancer surgery and therefore he has to be treated with uh, radiotherapy, stratectic radiotherapy instead. So, uh, there are patients that, uh, that, that have to deal with this kind of um, uh, issues and of course we would, uh, there will be an uh, impact of uh, this pandemic where we would see more patients uh, with more advanced uh, cancer after all this is over. So I guess in, in a few months or a year time from now, definitely. So, so, so it's, it's a very say, tough decision. Yeah, I yeah. mean, so you, you I say had, cannot yeah. delay, but uh, at the same time, we're told that, uh, you know, uh, it's risky to go to the hospital because of, of COVID-19. So in this current situation, is it really advisable to do surgery to remove uh, the tumor? I mean, can we, is there alternatives to uh, surgery in order to stabilize the, the tumor before surgery later on? Uh, what options are there? I mean, if 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 the if the if they have high risk disease and and you can't treat them with hormonal therapy, and there are no other no other uh, options, you either have to treat them with surgery, or you either have to treat them with radiotherapy, or you have to treat them with systemic treatment, which requires them to come to the hospital anyway. So um, it's kind of difficult to to to. Think of it that way. For example, if somebody who have a chemo pod that is in, that's infected, and or the uh, infected, so therefore this person can actually die from septicemia because of the infected chemo pod. So in order for us to not get the person to die from septicemia, we have to remove the chemo pod. So some some are life threatening. We have to do. Uh, some not so life threatening. We can actually delay. It perhaps up to about six weeks, because beyond six weeks, if they are medium risk, then there are some implication to be thought about. So I guess with the thing about um, the risk of infection at the hospital, so far, I think for my two hospitals, since the first few cases happened in February, we have not had any more cases because they have, they have actually put forward a very stringent, um, uh, what do you call that? Preventive uh, measures mm. to try to uh, contain this. So patients get checked uh, very stringently. So, it sh you know, the, the, the risk should be low. But, uh, of course, I cannot say that for, for, for all areas. Lah. So, um, of course. Um, you know, it, it's a challenging time with people needing to make decisions that sometimes will really literally mean whether or not they'll be able to survive uh, 
this period of, of the MCO and, and they are really needing a lot of help in terms of the decision making that need, they need to make. Yeah, but if, if let's say you see uh, who, so far from what we know, who are the people who are at specific risk uh, in getting the, 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 the infection and then maybe we'll, we'll get uh, serious uh, uh, consequences from it are the elderly, those yeah. with comorbidities, you know, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic kidney issues, and elderly with cancer. So if we know that, that they have specific risk and they have this, uh, this cancer risk, so we, we pick, pick and choose. So those that are not within that um, uh, group, then you, we can consider and try to mm. treat them because they could not die from the infection, but they could die from the cancer. So Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you know, this is the thing that that a lot of decisions are being made. You know, which, which disease is is going to be more of a concern. So one of the issues that has been raised recently is the uh, uh, the issue of people looking at alternative treatment uh, therapies at this point of time. You know, suddenly because it's so hard to access uh, allopathic medicine. You know, towards the, the usual treatment that they're able to go for, suddenly they're talking about jamus, they're talking about a different traditional uh, and sometimes very uh, dodgy kind of treatments uh, because they're desperate. I mean, Bunlui, uh, has there been any discussion? Uh, you can be honest here. I won't tell anyone <laughs> that you said it. <laughs> but has there been any discussion amongst patient groups that you know, they're starting to think about, you know, Chinese medicines or jamus and so forth, traditional medicine or treatment. So far, uh, no, because uh, all that we hear is mainly the follow-up being postponed like three months later. So all those that I know that are already on chemotherapy halfway through, they will continue. Doctors will not delay theirs unless they haven't started and they, they may want to wait for a month later. That could be the case. So far, I've not heard of many. They, they may be doing it quietly. We do not know. <laughs> <laughs> Alternatively, but uh, we don't have so much of these kind of questions or queries to us. Because for me, yes, I did say I felt scared you know, when I stepped into hospital to do my blood test. But uh, when I look back, I told myself, yeah, I have done all my precautions. I put on my mask, I put on my spec, and I practice physical distancing. Even the staff there are also doing that. So I've done all I need. So just leave aside all the worries and get going. Because I also have to think and consider the risk if I don't continue with the needed blood test, the needed treatment with the hospital treat. I have also have another risk to overcome my own survival, <laughs> right? It's just that it may not happen too soon. Like COVID-19 patient, it gets severe. Um, you know, the bad days may come very soon we may have longer days to, to go, but survival rate will sure be affected if we stop and uh, we don't continue. So like one more example for myself, apart from blood tests that I'm doing every two weeks now, I also need a monthly check that I can't do myself. I must go to hospital to do. That I will not tell myself not to go. I will tell myself, must go. <laughs> like early next mm -hmm. month, I will have to go. Yeah, every month I have to go for that once. No, <laughs> so the 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 cancer death rate. Uh, sorry, the the death rate from COVID nineteen. Uh, and as a, I mean, in cancer patients, just about 0.4%. percent. Mm. So I guess if if patients keep fearing not to come to get treatment when they are of a priority to actually get treatment, then the the cancer death is going to go up, not the yeah. COVID nineteen yeah. death. Uh, in cancer patients. Mm. I mean, that's the irony. Uh, and Dr. Masa, this is a question for you actually from a breast cancer care nurse uh, on that issue of, of how do you handle patients who, who want to follow up uh, but cannot with uh, hospital treatment and instead they rely on alternative therapy. I mean, we know the consequences of delaying or not following the recommended treatment. So how do you go about negotiating with the patients without hurting the feelings of the patient? Um, um, okay, one is there is no scientific data or scientific basis for 
trying the alternative therapy during COVID-19 or without COVID-19 pandemic. So there is no data at time zero and time now in, in terms of this treatment uh, being efficacious and also being safe, being safe. So that's also very important. Second is we have no idea what is the duration of taking the drug. And third is there is no uh, way, no, we also have no, the person have no idea whatsoever on how to assess whether what they are doing is actually working or not because they are doing it on their own. Mm -hmm. So, so all these three uh, comes to the, to the conclusion that uh, it's not a, a good idea to do, to do that. And then, of course, I would summarize by saying that, look at us, we've been working at the hospital every day without fail. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so far, so good, Alhamdulillah. So, so if I have to bathe myself with the hospital environment and seeing patients daily, but I've been okay because I follow the, what, what we have been told to do, you know, wash your hands, don't touch your, your mouth your mouth and nose and whatever, you know, and, and yeah, yeah, just do all, all of those. Don't worry, come for treatment, come for treatment. And, and don't, don't, don't disregard the cancer, fearing or something that we're not sure whether you're going to get or not. So yeah, it's the same thing like, like what I'm doing now. I, I'm going to work, I need to care for my cancer patients uh, and not fearing whether I'm going to get it or not. If I get it, we'll, 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 we'll manage it. But, uh, you know, there's been a, uh, you, I mean, you mentioned just now about teleconsultation and, and to some of it is, is also counseling and some of these very simple things that you just said, very, very reassuring words. And these are things that people need to hear to give the reassurance that they should focus on prioritizing their treatment and come in to get treatment. Uh, and this is something that maybe because they're scared of, of COVID-19 that they're deciding that they shouldn't or uh, can't go about doing. So, I mean, do you provide, a, uh, you know, a teleconsultation yourself? Uh, do you manage uh, uh, people who need more information? <laughs> I'm putting you on a spot there, but okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. My, my patients can email me and I, I've, I've been writing countless of letters for mm. their, uh, whatever that they need, the, through the roadblock, the working from home, uh, you know, whatever that they need. So yeah, they can talk to me. They also call our, our clinic and, and, and speak to us. Either my, my, my assistant let me know or I will speak to them myself. Uh, so it will depend on, on what, are, what are their needs. Uh, okay, so, so I, I, and we also have clinical trial patients whom we want to ensure that they come for their follow-up because there's, there's a protocol for us to follow. So yeah, we speak to them. Um, but they don't have my phone number, lah. That's 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 that's. But they can, <laughs> they can they can talk to me by the email. Yeah. Okay, I think that's that's fair. Uh, and the email is easily uh, uh, obtained from those yeah, who are already patients. Yeah. 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 And I, I'll call them if, when I need to actually speak to them. Yeah. I'll call them. Uh, so you know, Bunlui, one of the the issues that's been raised, uh, especially concerning these restrictions of movement is that, you know, uh, since traveling is very much restricted, uh, maybe you can go to other medical centers or clinics instead, uh, which are closer to you. You don't need to go to another uh, location or another city or even travel to Smananjong. Is that really an option for uh, people over there in Kuching? Well, if we're talking about cancer treatment, we have limitations. Within the state itself, it's always only Kuching. Mm. Yeah. But okay. if they're financially okay and having all the necessary letter and they want to go to KL, I'm sure they can still go. But now we also have problem with uh, flight availability. There's only one flight a day this month, uh, KL Kuching and vice versa. Yeah. So okay. I would say that if there's a need, still come to GH. Yes, in the beginning, I was saying that I myself feel scared, but I still went, you know. So I want to tell everyone here, if you have pay patient friends who are going to treatment, please tell them to continue. Unless the doctor is ready, please continue to go to hospital. All hospitals, I believe, practice very good physical distancing, screening and questioning. Like in public hospital here in Kuching, I must say that they've done a good job in the 
the RTU block or the oncological block that we used to have a lot of open access to hospital, uh, to the block. Now, almost all the access has been closed up and there's only one way in. And before you go in, you, you've got to be questioned by the nurse up and down, now left and right. <laughs> even free, whether you just come back from KL and all this. Like myself, when I came back from KL on the 29th of March, I was issued short a stay home notice and I have to sign and submit. I was, I was given a wristband as a reminder. They had to report my locations twice a day, even when I'm at home, based on my GPS per my handphone, twice wow. a day my location and there's numerous reminder to remind me to report my location through my handphone and I re I actually follow that very uh, diligently that one uh, trip that I have made um, uh, my medical trip to to uh, general hospital here so I completed the 14 days yeah so I, a lot of precaution has been taken here including our public hospital and also private hospital so Yes, we have to acknowledge the fear is in there. But we have to learn to transfer our fear into something we can manage. That is taking all the necessary precautions before and during our hospital trip. Then we have done all we can and what we can control. Then leave the rest aside. We'll be fine. Okay. Home, I shower. <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell everybody, we may be fearful, but if there's a need to go, just go because... Look at the doctors and the nurses, especially those in front line. They are there like maybe 12 hours or 14 hours a day. So after the hospital trip recently, I started to realize, um, you know, the sacrifice, you know, so, so much of sacrifice has been made by the frontline uh, medical staff, including those may not be in front line, but still go to hospital every day, like Dr. Mastura. <laughs> yeah. So um, we have to turn our fears and worries into actions that we can control. Then we'll be all right. Yeah, that, oh, that's, a that's, uh, patience. that's really inspirational, Bunwe. I think that's inspiring to hear that and, and gives strength to a lot of pe people, especially uh, patients who are uh, wanting to care about their health and trying to make these decisions whether or not to go simply because they're not just caring about themselves, but they're also caring about their family. So I think that's a really good point to make here. So we come up to the towards the end of today's session and maybe we want to... Uh, have a, uh, a closing statement from both of you. Uh, Dr. Mastura, go ahead. I actually want to suggest uh, two things. That is, one is for patients whom they are not sure whether they should come or not. Because one of the things that we can do as, as uh, one of the Malaysian, Malaysians is actually try not to uh, increase risk uh, to other people. So if they, have, they know that they have actually traveled somewhere, they know that they have risk because they have symptoms, or they know that they have, they may have history of contact. So uh, before they come, you they can actually call us so that they, we can tell them what to do, where to go, rather than coming to the to the center or to the hospital and putting all of us at risk. Because if that happens, um, you know the the care for the other patients will be affected as well because all of us are going to be quarantined and all of us are going to be PUI, you know, PUI. So that's one thing that I suggest. So if you're not sure, just call us, ask us what to do. If if you have any pressing uh, issues that you, you know you need to come and you know you you we will ask you some questions before you come. Second thing is actually um, I would like to um, ask our Malaysian public, those who have cancers, who actually come to the center and they must uh, if let's say because we the, at the hospital we are we are you know we are low in staff. Uh, you know we are understaffed. We do we do um, shifting because we want to make sure that that at least one staff uh, are available on standby. With the if one group uh, have to be quarantined if they if they are exposed. So we are understaffed. We are also learning as we go. So some there there are some circum, uh, circumstances where maybe for example the 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 chemo uh, chair uh, is not uh, you know there, there are a lot of patients in the daycare where you have to uh, you have to use somebody else's chair so maybe it's not there's not enough time or there's not enough staff to actually clean the chair before you use so i just want to get the our, our malaysian public to actually work with us maybe you can you can help us clean it yourself you know use uh, alcohol while when you can that so you can do this with us together 
rather than uh, you know putting the burden of trying to make sure everything is as well and everything is like okay <laughs> and be, you know every day you know every day we have to do this so we we need your cooperation and also maybe you can suggest to us uh, rather than uh, seeing like a like you know how come you are you know your private hospital and, and you're not doing this because we are we are learning we are learning this uh, with all of you actually mm. so that, that's 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 like a, a, a plea lah for me let us know uh, or help us in in, in doing this mm. thank you very much dr master i think that is a really uh, strong and uh, uh, I, I think in solidarity a message of solidarity with the public wanting to see what they can do to help uh, especially when they are going to uh, medical facilities like yours where you know uh, they're there to get treated but also they can do their bit to yeah. help reduce the the load of the people who are working there uh, the cleaning staff people like yourself and so forth i think that's a great message to send uh Bunlui, yourself for closing remarks yeah i have said quite a bit just now but i just like to add that if uh, certain patients are very doubtful on whether they should go to hospital uh, in public hospital especially, feel free to call up uh, GH. I know it's not easy to reach out to the doctor specifically, but you can still call and get to the oncological department. Talk to the doctor, tell them name and IC number. They'll be able to help you to check back. Yeah, it may be a long wait, but it's worth calling rather than decide for yourself not to come. That is not a good idea. So mm -hmm. must make sure that you get access and to clarify your queries or your doubts before you say you don't want to come to hospital for treatment. Yeah. So come. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Come. One more thing is that we, um, we as in SCAN, no, our society, we are trying to do some kind of online support. At the moment, what uh, the public can do, especially those in Kuching, they can actually text us over our Facebook uh, messenger yeah, and then in the long run, we'll see how we can provide some kind of uh, phone support, uh, which will need to take us some time before we gather our resources because everyone is volunteer, you see. We need enough volunteer base before we start any uh, phone call support. So meanwhile, Facebook Messenger is still a good way to reach out to us if there's something to share with us. But anything medical, do go back to your doctor as best possible. Yeah. Thank you, Bun Lui. That is a really good reminder for all of us. I think starting to look at, you know, uh, uh, traditional medicine or alternative therapies in times like these can be a desperate move and certainly could be one that we will actually have to uh, pay for because it's basically the wrong decision to make, but it could be very harmful for many of us who are needing specialized treatment and especially for patients who are looking at a treatment of breast cancer during this very difficult time. It is something that we need to be able to uh, emphasize on is to always communicate with your doctor. That people are able to be, uh, in the past, it would be harder to get hold of people like Dr. Mastura, but now people have WhatsApp, they have email, all times of the day, maybe not very happy about it, but that's how it is, you know. But certainly it's a better situation today, even with the MCO and the COVID-19 uh, crisis, people are still able to get hold of their medical team to help out. And I think this is very important uh, for us to continue to uh, be in communication with one another, support each other, help each other, and most importantly, uh, to be able to uh, ask for help when they need to. And I think would be your point there just now is that people need to be able to uh, know to access uh, assistance when they need to, especially during this period. So uh, I just wanted to thank all of you, uh, our two speakers, uh, Sri Bun Lui and Dr. Masturam Mayusuf, for joining us uh, for this webinar organized by the Cancer Care Working Group and the Galen Center for Health and Social Policy to discuss about accessing uh, breast cancer care during the MCO and COVID-19 period. Uh, I do hope that uh, all of you here who have not yet uh, followed uh, the Facebook uh, page of the Cancer Care Working Group, the link is there at the bottom of the screen, uh, because we will be organizing more of these webinars uh, for uh, this period where we're having the MCO 
until that period of time where we're not going to be able to see each other face to face. We are going to depend on webinars to get these discussions across. And the next session is hopefully going to be about lung cancer. So I do hope that you join us for that uh, webinar, which will be coming up next week. So with that, uh, thank you all for your uh, participation. And I, I would like to wish everyone uh, uh, Best of luck, take care of each other, and most importantly, stay safe during this period uh, of the MCO. With that, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and a very good uh, afternoon to all. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you Dr. Masrua, too. who are due for their mammogram, ultrasound, their routine assessment, or maybe some patients who are on for routine assessment uh, with scans because they have